everybody. Um, this is the first of our sustainability and resilience uh, virtual gathering series. And um, we're really excited to be bringing these to all of the employees as a way to uh, stay engaged, um, stay healthy, uh, learn some things together and um, and share our own expertise with each other. So um, just a couple of logistics. Uh, we're going to have everybody muted during the kind of the content section of the of the gathering and then there will be um, a period at the uh, of 15 minutes at the end of each of the gatherings where folks can um, do Q&A and, um, and we would like everybody to put in their name, their department, and their email into the chat room as a way of introducing um, ourselves. And, um, and then that way we also have contact information for any resources that we um, can share after the after the session and then to let you know uh, if there are any new um, gatherings that we've added or are um, coming up and just as a way to hear back from you if there are other topics that might be of interest um, to you we can we can sort that out too so um, I'd like to introduce myself and my team. I'm Kathy Wicks, the Director of Sustainability for Auxiliary Enterprise. We have Tyler Tedesco, who's the Regional Food Systems Coordinator for our team. And then for today's session, our content expert is Dan Bensonoff, who is our fearless leader in the, all of the permaculture gardens on campus. So um, just let me know. Uh, we'll be we'll be monitoring the chat and uh, and if there are any questions that come up during the um, the content piece, go ahead and put them in there. We are recording this, so we'll be able to um, we'll be able to uh, have other people see it, but also so that we can just keep um, improving. This is new to us, and we're as I said, really excited that you all are here to join us. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dan take over. We're going to um, we're going to put him on. Uh, if, I, if I could add one more uh, okay. bit of housekeeping, if you haven't done so already, uh, the probably the best way to view this would be to um, change the zoom to speaker view that way when when Dan is talking he'll be the the larger screen on and everyone else will be on mute so all right I'm gonna do this all right Dan take it away all right thank you Kathy hi everybody good morning uh, we're here out in the Franklin permaculture garden on a beautiful and fairly crisp spring morning it's a really exciting time to be out here. The garden is really coming to life and you can really feel it today. I can see behind me our peach tree starting to bloom and behind us over here, we've got a bunch of dandel, uh, daffodils that are coming in. Um, our garlic is starting to really come up. So it's a really exciting time to be out. And uh, one thing I wanna, you know, you probably noticed that this pandemic has really brought in a lot of excitement around resiliency, around really starting to take take care of ourselves, our families, our communities in a deep way. And really rethinking some of the ways that our economy is set up. And one way that we can really start to do that is by gardening, by growing our own food, perhaps growing our own medicine as well, or just growing something that's beautiful that really makes you feel welcome at home. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to really get started uh, in the garden in spring, what you can be doing right now to really create a, an abundant garden for yourself for this upcoming season. Um, so we're going to, uh, my, my hope is that we'll talk about uh, what to do if you don't currently have a garden, uh, you can go about starting one right now, uh, what plants you might be considering seeding, um, whether it's indoors or outdoors um, in the next few weeks. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, caring for perennials, trees and shrubs and flowers, um, various things that, you know, we can uh, come back year after year. So 
Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll show you guys around a little bit, see what's going on over here. Um, and I wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions. So after each segment, I'm gonna pause. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to have some conversation, um, but also we'll have that Q&A section at the end. So if you do have any thoughts, if you wanna share your experience as well, just type it into the chat box there and uh, Kathy will facilitate that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I wanna you know, just kind of start actually by talking a little bit about um, how to think about this season. So if you don't currently have a garden or if you do have a garden, when you're thinking about what to plant this season, I think it's really tempting right now to just go, you know, I'm gonna plant as much as possible, right? Because all this time at home and in spring, there's just this sensation that you wanna get your hands in the soil. You really wanna grow. You wanna take care of the earth. You wanna grow food for yourself or your family. Um, and that's wonderful and I highly encourage that. But I think it's really important to start by really getting realistic about what can you do come July, August, September? How much time, how much energy are you going to have? And really think backwards from there. Plan backwards and think about how much you want to invest. I've seen a lot of gardeners put a lot of energy into their gardens in April and May. And then come June, July, the weeds start to take over. Um, they don't have time to harvest. And all their hard work, unfortunately, you know, isn't reaped. So really take some time to think first about what the season's going to look like for you. And then really start to think about what you want to try to tackle. You know, I, I personally think that small, slow steps are the way to go. Um, so don't till up, you know, if you have two acres and you've never gardened before, I would not necessarily recommend just tilling up the whole yard and planting a big farm right away, right? So make small steps, see how it goes. You can always expand more as the season goes on or next year. Um, so take some time to think about that. So I want to talk about how to start a garden if you don't currently have one, right? Here we are, this, is, this garden has been here now for about 10 years. We're actually coming up on our 10 year anniversary this year, which is exciting. So this is a fairly established garden in many ways, but what if you just have a yard with some grass, maybe some you know, overgrown areas, maybe you have a forest that you're trying to convert to a garden. What can you do in that situation? Well, there's a lot of different ways that you can grow, go from a lawn or an overgrown patch into a cultivated garden that's going to be productive within its first year, right? And of course, it will get better and better, but there's a few different strategies I want to point out right away. So first, I want to show you guys one of our raised beds here, because a raised bed is really one of the easiest ways of getting started right away. So these raised beds here, they've been here for three years now. You can see it's just some lumber that's, you know, that we screwed together, nothing fancy. Um, I would, uh, it's important to note that you don't necessarily need to use bought lumber. You know, you can use all sorts of different materials for making a raised bed. If you have big stones, maybe you have, you know, a, a pile of rubble or a stone wall behind your house, you can use that. If you have big logs, you know, thick logs that you took, you know, from a tree that you took down, you can make those into whatever shape you want. As long as you have a way of containing soil, that's all you really need. And the beautiful thing about a raised bed is that it allows you to fill it in with really high quality soil um, that's going to be really, really well draining. It's gonna warm up faster than the soil right on the ground because it's raised up. And that's gonna give you a jump on spring. It also means that you don't necessarily have to tear up your grass in any way. You could just build right on top of it. And very importantly, if you're in an urban setting, there's a very good chance that your soils may have heavy metals such as lead or arsenic in them. And in that case, you wouldn't really want to be eating directly from those soils. So in general, I recommend, you know, if you can get a soil test, you'll be able to find out more about your soil. But if you build a raised bed, you know, you won't be able to, uh, you don't have to worry about that because you can fill it in with uh, contaminant free soil and you'll be ready to go right away. So if you don't want to build a raised bed, you want to garden right in the ground, that's great. That's what we do for most of our garden beds here. Um, and if you uh, don't have access to a plow or some way that you can till the grass under, the best strategy that I usually recommend is to, uh, to kill the grass by making sure that uh, covering it with something. So the easiest way of doing that is if you have access to cardboard, you know, from a store, or just from your neighbors, um, you can lay down cardboard flat and then cover it with either wood chips or soil or compost 
or straw, anything that's going to just keep it, you know, that's going to weigh down the cardboard and keep it moist. And that cardboard within one or two months will completely kill your grass off and allow you to plant into it. And in fact, even before the grass is dead, you can just make holes right in the cardboard and start planting right into that. But that's a really, really easy, lazy way of going from grass uh, or overgrown area to a garden setting very, very quickly. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now in my own home. I bought a, a house in September of this year. I didn't really have a chance to do much in the fall because we were busy pack, you know, getting ourselves uh, settled into our house. So this spring, thankfully we have this you know, wonderful, uh, all of these DCs and they have tons of cardboard. So I actually brought a bunch home, laid it flat right outside in my backyard. And I put some compost down right on top, just a one inch layer. And at this point, uh, that grass has already died down significantly. It's really kind of yellow and brown underneath there. And I've been just digging holes and putting plants right in the ground right there. And by the end, you know, in a month or two, I will be able to plant in there with much ease. So that grass won't be uh, competing with those plants any longer. And it'll be a, you know, a, full, a really legitimate garden at that point. So those are a few really easy ways to go about it. Of course, you can also hire someone to come in with a rototiller and plow your garden up or your, your, uh, sorry, your lawn. And in that case, you'll be ready to go right away. Uh, so a couple things to think about if you don't yet have a garden. If you do have a garden, I want to talk about what you can be doing to manage to take care of your soil. Uh, here in the permaculture garden, we manage our garden organically, and that really means that we care for the soil first, right? The soil is what feeds the plants. The soil, it's not just the medium for our plants to grow, it's really the fundamental aspect of a healthy garden. So it's essential that we feed the soil regularly. The spring is a fantastic time to be feeding your soil. So I'm gonna show you guys what we do to prepare our soils in the spring. So I would, the first thing that you wanna do, first of all, is you know, get to know your soil a little bit. Um, pick it up, look at it, smell it. Um, does it feel clay if you are able to really, you know, if you push your soil in and it creates that kind of clay, like you can mold it like you would um, some clay, then that's gonna give you a lot of information about what's going on in here. If it's really sandy, that's also really important to know. So that's your soil texture. That's gonna give you a sense of what you're working with. Um, if you have sandy or clay soils, the best remedy is adding a lot of compost. Compost is a beautiful substance. It's just basically broken down organic material. You can see actually we've already added some on top of here. It's nice black, it's like chocolate cake, right? Um, we call it black gold. Um, and uh, compost is fantastic for both loosening up heavy clay soils and also uh, allowing sandy soils to really hold moisture. Because the problem with sand is that it drains too fast. And so all, you would know, be constantly having to water. And the problem with clay soils is that they don't drain fast enough. So you have these soggy soils that will eventually rot your roots. Either problem you have can be remedied by adding compost. And we usually add compost in the spring, but you can also add it in the fall. Uh, so what we do with our soils is we go through with a fork. This is just a handy dandy garden fork. One of the most important tools that any gardener can own. Um, and it's really important that you start your spring garden by loosening your soils. Over the winter time, uh, your soils have been impacted by snow, uh, by people walking on them, by traffic maybe, whatever it might be. Your soil needs to breathe in the spring. So what we do is we just go through with our garden fork. We do have another tool that we used to do this, but this is a really easy one. We don't even flip the soil over. We just loosen it just like that. And then I'm going to kind of go back and I just do this roughly every six inches. I just kind of wiggle it around. And what I'm really doing through this process is I'm getting air down into the soil level. I'm decompacting it. I'm creating really good soil tilt. And soil tilt is basically the structure of your soils. You want soil that's really soft. I want to be able to stick my fingers right in there. And if I'm meeting a lot of resistance, that means that the plant's roots are going to also meet resistance. And I want them to be able to really go deep into the soil horizon. And the best Dan, way to do that is by decompacting. Dan, if, uh, if somebody rototills their lawn for a plot, should they dig out the clumps of grass left behind? That's a great question. So yeah, someone, uh, if you're rototilling, 
the general recommendation is that you rototill twice. Now, of course, that's not always you know, uh, possible. That's, that's not always practical for people. So yes, if you get, if you rototill once and you're going straight from grass, you are going to have these big lumps of sod. Um, and those lumps of sod will regrow unless you either take them out or you exclude them from light. So there's a few different ways of doing that. Yeah, you can go through, rake it out and just pull them out by hand. If it's a small area, that's probably what I would do. I would just pull those pieces of sod out by hand throw them in the compost bin or just, you know, put them in the woods if you don't have a compost bin. Um, or you can exclude the soil, uh, uh, exclude light by doing a few things. You can uh, put cardboard down or some kind of a mulch. For example, you could put a really, really thick layer of straw. I would go, you know, up to four or six inches. Otherwise that grass will come back. So really, really thick mulch would also exclude the light. Um, or lastly, you could put down a cover crop. And a cover crop is basically uh, some kind of a plant that will grow faster than the native vegetation than the grass. Uh, it'll exclude the light and it'll outcompete everything else there. Um, so you can do one of those strategies. Probably the easiest would be just putting down a really, really heavy mulch until you're ready to plant, in which case at that time you can start to pull the mulch back. But the longer that that light is excluded, the more that grass will die down and the easier it'll be for you to plant. I should also mention on that note, if you are going straight from grass to garden, I would generally recommend that you don't plant finely seeded crops that first season. Plant really, really hardy crops that you're gonna be starting from transplants or putting whole plants. Tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, corn. Those are gonna be really good options for the most part. If you're doing something like carrots or beets, uh, it's going to be really, really tough for them to grow because you're still going to have this really chunky soil. And those plants prefer really fine soils. Um, so I would recommend starting with really, really hardy plants that are going to grow quickly and are going to be transplants to start. So getting back to soil prep. So after I go through, I'm going to you know, eventually fork this whole garden. Uh, again, I'm not really trying to turn the soil over. And there's a few reasons I don't want to do that because if I do turn the soil over, all of the weed seeds that are currently on the bottom, somewhere deep in the soil horizon, will all of a sudden be on the surface where they can start to germinate. I don't want that. I don't want to have to weed any more than I already do. Um, so I just want to kind of loosen it up. And then my next step usually is adding some kind of organic fertilizer in the spring. Um, I, I generally don't do this when I'm planting in the summer, but in the spring it's really important. Um, and I generally use, Oh, it's a little upside down right now. This is uh, an organic fertilizer. Um, I don't necessarily recommend this product, but this is good. You want to look for something that's well balanced. And what's going to tell you that is these numbers. So this one says 534. 534 means that that's the percent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's not really important that you remember that, but if you, you, you want to look for something that's going to have roughly those numbers. So three, four, five, 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 something like that is good. If it says 12, zero, zero, for example, we don't want to use that usually because that's just going to be pure nitrogen boost. Now, if you know your soils really well and you know what you need, you can get exactly the kind of fertilizer you need. This is just a well-rounded organic fertilizer. It's chicken manure and feather meal and all sorts of other things added to it. So it's really well balanced. It's not very strong, but um, it, it's going to provide most of the nutrition we need to get our plants off to a really, really good start. And you do want to look at the rates on the back of the bag in terms of how much you need to add. Um, I've already kind of figured that out for this bed. So I know roughly uh, I need about a cup for this whole bed. So, you know, I'm going to just go around and sprinkle a little bit right in there. I'm going to go ahead and just do this whole bed while I'm at it. And I'm not being very particular here, you know, you just kind of put it around. We're going to be planting lettuce in this bed. So it's not a very heavy feeder, but it doesn't need a little bit. So there we go. Beautiful. Okay, so I got a little bit of fertilizer in there. And again, I really do encourage people to use organic fertilizer. Uh, it makes a big difference. If you're using a synthetic fertilizer, they're very, very soluble, which means that in there right away, all of that nutrition you put in is just going to wash right out. The other thing is that it will potentially contaminate waterways near you, um, so there are potential environmental issues with uh, synthetic fertilizers. 
So uh, any garden center, um, Home Depot, all these places, they all carry organic fertilizer. Just look for anything that's going to be based on either manure or compost or feather meal, bone meal, soybean meal, something like that. Um, you should be good. So once I have my uh, fertilizer down, um, at this point, generally, I would add uh, a, t a top dressing of compost, really, really well broken down. Um, if you don't have access to compost, that's okay. You don't necessarily need to add it every single time. Um, that's generally our practice here. And then again, that's our way of feeding the soil. Because every time we harvest the crop from here, we are taking nutrients out of this system. So we need to replenish them. And fertilizer is one way of doing that. Compost is another. Compost doesn't have nearly as much nutrition in it, but it creates really, really good soil till, and it'll create a weed-free environment on top because we use compost that's been well broken down, which means that all of the weed seeds in there are, have been burned up or have already germinated. And so we're gonna have a nice weed-free environment. If you don't have compost, though, that's okay. Um, you do wanna work your fertilizer in a little bit. So whether that's just scratching it in a little bit by hand, just like this, or if you want, you could use a rake. But whatever you have, just go ahead and scratch it into that top inch or two. That's all you really need to do. It doesn't need to go very deep. Couple of yeah. quick questions, Dan. Yeah. Um, how, uh, if you're doing a raised bed, should you put a liner down um, before you put that in? And then how tall should the raised beds be? Those are both great questions, yeah. So the liner question. Uh, you really only need a liner if you're working on contaminated soil, right? So I used to live in Boston. I did a lot of urban gardening in extremely contaminated soils. The lead levels were through the roof, extremely dangerous. We definitely didn't want any roots going through the raised bed and harvesting that lead in the ground. So what we did is we did we put a landscape fabric down, which is a synthetic material that would stop any roots from growing further. Uh, so if you are in an urban setting, um, I do recommend that you use some kind of a, um, a, a cap on the soil. Um, if you're not sure if your soils are contaminated, uh, it's really up to you. Do you want to take the chance? Do you want to, uh, or do you want to just, you know, see what happens? I generally recommend if you don't know, especially if you're in an urban setting, that you do cap them. Um, now, if you don't cap your soil, the height of the bed, you don't have to go quite as high, right? Because um, your plants will be able to actually put their roots into the ground below the raised bed. If you are capping your soil and then building up your raised bed, you want to go generally at least 18 inches. That's my recommendation. This bed is not capped and it's a little bit less. It's probably about a foot. And that also does depend a little bit on what you're planning to grow in here. If you're going to be growing shorter season crops um, that are going to be harvested within a month or two, they're generally not going to be as deeply rooted as something like, um, you know, tomatoes that are going to be in the ground for four or five months or potatoes, something like that. Um, so it, it does a little bit depend on what you're going to be growing. The more, the higher up your raised beds are, uh, the more soil, uh, you know, the, the better the soil tilt will be. So it's never a bad idea, but I would say somewhere between 12 and 18 inches is the sweet spot. 18 inches is fine. Now, the other thing is that you might want to have a higher raised bed simply because it's easier to work in. If you have a bad back, you might not want to be bending over all the time. So in that case, you can build it up even higher. There are actually even raised beds that, you know, the whole thing is raised off. It's not even touching the ground at all. That's a little bit more work to build, but if that's going to make you comfortable, that's a really good option. So I think, you know, uh, as long as you have at least a foot, um, that should be sufficient for at least short season crops. If you're doing long season crops, I'd go 18 inches, especially if it's capped. It's a great question. Any other questions so far? Not yet. Okay, great. So once I have my fertilizer down, I've got my compost down, at that point I would be ready to plant. Now I wanna talk about what can we be planting right now? So let's see. I don't actually, we haven't come up yet, but I wanna just, I wanted to walk over here because we've already planted a few beds. I'll show you guys actually some of the plants we put in. So in these two beds, actually these three beds right here, we've already direct seeded some crops. Um, so in these two beds that I'm looking at right now, uh, we've direct seeded some spinach. Spinach is one of the most cold hardy greens you can grow. Um, as long as your soils are workable, you can put them in really anytime. 
Um, so now's a great time you're putting them in. And we just went through, we created uh, rows to put our seeds in. Um, and most seed packets will tell you how deep you want to put your seeds. Um, and in this bed right here, we've planted some peas. Uh, this is a sugar snap pea, so we're gonna have to trellis them. Um, but they should be coming up in the next week or so. Um, and ideally, if you're gonna be direct seeding, you want to either water them in right away, or even better, try to direct seed a day or two before a heavy rain, because that's really what's gonna create that germination for you. So if you have really dry weather coming up for the next week, you have to water. Okay, it's really, really important. If germinated seeds dry out for a period of time, as they're germinating, they're gonna die. So really, really important that the soil stays moist throughout that period when they're germinating. So those are some uh, crops that we're direct seeding. We're also gonna be direct seeding some uh, arugula this week, some turnips, and some mustard greens. I believe that's, all, uh, that's what we have planned. But we're also already starting to transplant some crops that we've been growing out indoors. Let me show you guys how we do that. So if you come over here, See, we've got this, this is a row cover here. It's also called Rime. It's just, it's a synthetic spun material that provides a little bit of additional warmth to the crops, uh, and it also excludes pests and animals. So that's part of the reason we put it up. Um, certainly we want it to be a little bit warmer, but really importantly, this garden is home to a lot of rabbits and a woodchuck, and they love their greens. So uh, we've known to, uh, you know, we want to cover our seedlings, We'll uncover them at some point. It's really that initial uh, stage right after the transplant that we want to be covering them up because that's when they're at their most vulnerable, right? They're still babies. So we prep these beds just like I showed you with the other ones. This is right in the ground, not a raised bed. And just want to show you guys what we've got going on under here. This is a kale bed right here. So you can see these transplants, we started them in the, our greenhouse uh, probably in mid-March. They take about a month or so from seeding to transplant. Um, this is a variety called Red Russian, uh, but you can be growing any kind of kale. Most plants in the brassica family are very cold hardy. So the brassicas are your kale, your cabbage, your broccoli, cauliflower, um, bok choy, uh, and you know, a whole other kind of like mustardy type greens. They have a similar flavor. They're all hardy, well below zero, and you can be planting them either from seed or from transplant in the, right now. April's a great time to be doing that. These are gonna be ready for harvest in about a month. Uh, we're gonna harvest them pretty young because we actually are gonna be planting peppers in this bed eventually. And that's something that we're always thinking about is how can we create multiple successions? We wanna get as much mileage out of all of our beds as possible. So some spring planting and then transitioning to a summer planting is a great way of doing that because we can get multiple crops out of just one bed in a season. That might be more work than you're able to do and that's perfectly fine. So even if you can just get one crop in the ground wherever you are, that's, that's gonna be a really good start. And you can see there's already starting some weeds starting to come up here. I can see some some grasses coming up here. So in the next week or two, I'm probably going to have to come in here and just do some really, really light cultivation, even just with my fingers, just like that. And this is really important. In the spring, there's a lot of weeds that are going to start coming up. And it's the, the best time to be doing your weeding is when you can barely see the weeds. Um, if they are already large enough that you have to rip them out of the grounds, you've already created a lot more work for yourself. So just go through, even if they're just you know, barely visible, and just scuffle your soil. This is really, this step is the most important thing you can do to make sure that you're not gonna be fighting weeds all season long. And then you have this you know, really nice cultivated look as well. Uh, and these guys should be good for you know, a while at this point, so at least another couple weeks. But as the weather warms up, we're gonna really start getting into weed season. So Dan, will yeah. you plant those again in the fall? So is That's it a great question. spring, summer, and then fall? Yeah, so kale is really versatile. There are actually a, variety, a lot of different varieties, some of which do better in the heat. You can grow kale all season long. You could start it in the spring as we did here, 
and then just pick the leaves all season long. Usually by the time you reach late summer, a spring planting won't be as productive anymore. It'll really have matured quite a bit. But yeah, certainly you can plant in uh, for the fall as well. Usually if you're gonna be planting for the fall, you'd wanna get those in by the end of July if you want full size kale. Um, but you can plant baby kale even into late September. And actually, I wanna show you guys, this is our kale planted last season uh, from the fall. And we didn't expect this to come back actually. Um, this is a variety called White Russian. We planted these uh, in August of last year. And we got a lot of harvest in the fall. And then because we had a fairly mild winter, a lot of these survived and actually, I've been eating these for the last two weeks and they are so good. They're like the most tender, perfect salad greens. So yeah, get them in the fall. They might even survive the winter and then you'll have an early spring snack. Yeah. Any other questions so far? We've got a, one more question. Um, should we use preen, prevent weeds from growing? Should we use, I'm sorry, what was that? Preen, P-R-E-E-N, prevent. You know, I'm actually, I'm not growing. familiar with that. So maybe whoever wrote it in, maybe you can tell us what, what that is. And um, maybe we'll save that for the Q&A. Sure. Sounds good. Um, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, caring for perennials. So if you have a tree or a shrub or some brambles uh, or flowers that come back year after year, uh, whatever you may have, I want to just talk about what you can be doing for them right now. So I'm gonna, let's, why don't we walk over to one of our perennial areas over here. As we're walking, I just want to show you guys, this is our gar garlic that's coming up right here. This is fall planted, uh, planted on Halloween. And you can see it's doing really, really well. Garlic's one of the best plants I recommend if you're new to gardening, it's extremely easy to grow. So I'm just gonna grab a shovel. We're gonna, I wanna show you guys how we care for some of our perennials in the spring. Uh, why don't we walk over to our uh, daily patch over here. While we're walking, can you just say why garlic is easy? Yeah, absolutely. So garlic, uh, first of all, has essentially no pests uh, because of its strong flavor. There are very, very few animals and insects that are interested in it. Um, the other thing is it's extremely hardy and robust, right? So it survives winter, of course, because it is planted in the fall. Um, and it's also one of the few plants that we can put in the ground in the fall, which is a time of year when we generally have more time. Um, so all you have to do for, to plant garlic, you take a bulb, you divide it up into individual cloves and you stick a clove in the ground about four inches deep and all of a sudden you have a garlic plant in spring. So they're really, really easy for that reason. And they don't need any additional nutrition. Um, they can handle rough soils. They're extremely easy to grow. So highly recommend them. Thank you. So I wanted to show you guys, this is one of our perennial patches here. We've got a lot of different flowers. We have a peach tree right here. We have a lot of medicinal herbs in this patch all sorts of things, and they're just starting to come up right now. So one thing I would say is if you have trees especially, fruiting trees, now is really the last time of the year that you wanna be doing any kind of pruning on them. In general, you wanna be cutting branches, uh, you know, pruning out any dead growth, diseased growth, damaged stuff in the winter, but if you haven't gotten to it, do it now, before May, because once these plants leaf out, uh, we're really going to be losing a lot of energy by cutting them. And that might be something you want. If that plant is getting too vigorous, you could actually wait till it leaves out to do that pruning. But otherwise, do it now if you can. Um, and if you can't get to it, it's okay. You can always get to it next year. The other really important thing that you want to be doing with your perennials right now is dividing them. This is the time of year that you can be getting free plants extremely easily just by digging out them, digging them out and separating them out. I wanna show you guys how we do that by looking at our daylilies over here. So come on over with me. Actually, we can, yeah, I can even show you with the mint too, but why don't I start with the daylilies here? So you guys are probably, some of you might be familiar with daylilies. Uh, they're a really common ornamental plant. 
One thing that you probably don't know about them is that they're actually also edible at a few different stages, which is one of the reasons we grow them here. Um, I've been eating these shoots for the last couple weeks. I just cut them right at the base. And before they're about, you know, up to about six inches tall, they are fantastic green for stir fries. You know, you can cook them like you would kale or collard, something like that. Um, so really, really easy to grow. Um, and if you don't have some, I bet one of your neighbors does. And all, all you have to do to make a patch is dig some up. This is called dividing. And there's a lot of perennial plants, a lot of herbs, a lot of flowers that not only can be divided, but actually need to be divided every few years in order to stay vigorous. Um, if not, they'll start to overcrowd each other. So this patch definitely could use some division. All I'm doing is I'm just digging up a patch and then I'm just gonna separate these out. Now you can see that's, that's a plant right there that I could stick in the ground somewhere else and it will take off and it'll start to create its own patch. So this is a baby from this you know, huge mother patch here. Um, and you can see just from that little shovel full I got, see, I can probably get a couple more plants out of here if I needed to. So I wanna just make sure, whenever I'm doing divisions, you wanna make sure you have a nice section of root and a little bit of top growth. But otherwise, it's extremely easy. So you can see I got just three plants from that tiny little section. So if someone wanted some daylilies, they could just come out here and grab a plant. And all, in a year, this is going to take up a large section of your yard. In fact, if anything, it might get too aggressive. But this is an extremely easy way of getting three plants because it is expensive to go to the nursery and to get a ton of plants for your yard. Um, so I always encourage people to learn a little bit about propagation, how to make more plants, because it will save you a ton of money and very importantly, it'll make you a lot of friends too. I give away a lot of free plants to people in my neighborhood and they, you know, they love it, right? It's, it creates a really good sense of community. Um, and for me, it's just, it's actually a way that I have to, what I have to do anyway to keep my, my plants healthy. I have to divide them. Otherwise they will start to overcrowd themselves. Um, so, uh, if you have some perennials, which is really any plant that comes back year after year, um, look into and find out how you can propagate it. Uh, most perennials that spread, that will create runners, rhizomes, like daylilies, like mints, like oregano, um, all of those plants can easily be propagated just by digging up a section and, and you know, creating some more plants that way. I can do that same thing here with my mint patch. So we can save these for later. But you can see, I'll just do one more quick demo here with the mint. If I wanted some mint, you can see it's actually, as you guys probably know, mint is extremely aggressive, extremely easy to grow. And it's already coming into this pathway here. So I, I don't want it in the pathway. So I'm actually gonna just dig up a section here. Just crush off the soil a little bit. And as long, I, you can really even just tear that off. This right here, just a little section, is all you would need to create a new mint bed. Now, of course, I, whenever planting mint, I would recommend putting it in a place where you'll either easily be able to control its growth or you won't mind if it takes over because it does do that. Uh, but this rhizome right here, it's got some really nice roots coming down and some nice mint. That's all you need and all of a sudden you have a new, a new uh, plant. So, you know, if I wanted to, I can create literally thousands of new plants from this one mint patch. Um, and again, that's the case with a lot of plants. And really, you want to be doing this process of division in April to maybe mid-May. Once these plants start to flower, if you try to divide them, you're going to most likely kill them. They don't transplant well, not to mention the fact that it's also a lot hotter, so you'll have to water them much more frequently because they need to stay moist as they're getting established as a new plant. So this is the best time to be doing that. Go out, you know, you could be dividing hostas right now. You could be dividing um, all sorts of different plants that you probably already have in your garden. Ferns can easily be divided. Um, so uh, this is a good time to be doing that and to be making some friends along the way. So I'm gonna save these. I'm gonna bring these over to some friends and maybe get, you know, uh, create some new meat patches in my neighborhood. Um, Dan, so that, I wanna, when, yeah. Dan, when you um, say in a place that it can be contained, 
what, what do you mean by that? Because I've had oregano kind of jump across the lawn. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there's, there are different ways of containing aggressive plants. And I should say, don't, you know, I don't want to scare anyone away from including plants that are really aggressive. Um, because a lot of them are extremely valuable for us, right? I mean, mint is such a wonderful plant, right? You can use it in food, you can use it for, to make tea, you can use it medicinally. Um, it's just, it, it's such an important plant to have around the house. Every time you walk by, you smell it, you feel better. Um, so you wanna think about how to include it. My strategy is you know, one of two things. Either I'm gonna put it in uh, some kind of a pot so that it literally can't spread any further and sometimes if I don't want it, you know, if, if I have a container and it's not the prettiest, I'll actually bury a pot underground, but that will still serve as a rhizome barrier because mint spreads by kind of by these rhizomes that will go further and further out. So that's one thing you could do is just put it in a pot and either put it in the soil or put it, you know, anywhere where you'll be able to access it um, or put it in a place where it's going to be outcompeted all around it. So usually, uh, mint won't be very competitive with grass. So if it's surrounded by a lawn, most likely that mint is not going to be able to spread too much further out to the lawn. It will be able to spread into any bare soil we do, though. So that's what I would be careful of. And clearly here it's spreading into our pathway, which is just wood chips. Um, so what we do here, we have, you know, luckily enough help that we can go through and literally pull these plants out of the grounds. But we have to do that several times a year. That just shows you how aggressive uh, mint is. So if I wanted to, I could install what's called a rhizome barrier along the pathway, which is just a plastic or aluminum strip about one foot long, and it's buried underground. But honestly, that's a lot of work. So unless you, you really want to have a large mint patch, you want to really keep it contained, I would either put it in a pot, because even just a little bit of mint goes a long way, or again, put it in a place where it's going to be surrounded by even more aggressive plants. Great question. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions out there about perennial care? We're just about up to um, up to the Q and A time, anyway. Okay. So if there's anything else that you want to cover before we move into that, um, you got a couple more minutes. Well, um, I think we could probably go right into Q and A, and if something comes up, I'm happy to to ramble on a little bit. But I, I'm more interested in what folks want to hear about. Uh, learn about. I'm happy to talk about specific plants. I'm happy to talk about your specific situation. Um, if you're not sure what to be planting, if you're not sure what to be doing right now, um, I want to walk you guys through whatever you want to hear about. If you want to talk about your experience, um, feel free to, to chime in. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for all of um, the, the tips of the trade and um, for folks who do have questions, why don't you cue them up in the, um, in the chat and we'll uh, share them with Dan. Um, the uh, first question is, are garlic transplants likely to survive if we plant the starters now? I have raised bed gardens. Is it necessary to put the heat treated straw with garlic or is that really just for fall clove planting? Great questions. Okay, so let's talk about garlic for a minute. So uh, if you're planting garlic from a bulb, right, from those the individual cloves, um, then it is too late to start it right now because those cloves need to go through a winter in order to wake up. Um, so if you want to plant garlic now, you'd have to find some plants, which is hard to find from a store. Most nurseries don't sell garlic transplants. Um, However, sometimes you actually will find them growing kind of semi-wild. Uh, my neighbor actually, for whatever reason, has a ton of wild garlic growing all over his yard. And what actually, what I've been able to do just in the last few weeks, I dug up a few big clumps um, and was able to just separate out the individual plants and each one had a little bulb, uh, clove attached to the bottom. And I stuck those right in the ground every four or five inches. Um, and so you can transplant them right now. I wouldn't wait too much longer. Really in the next week or so is kind of the time you'd want to do that. Um, but again, you would have to find some started garlic plants, which is not so easy to do unless you are able to recognize them. Um, so uh, you also asked about the mulch. That's a great question. 
Um, there's a lot of back and forth discussion among growers about the importance of mulch. We use mulch on our garlic for a few reasons. One thing is that it means that we have to do a lot less weeding in the spring and summer, right? So our garlic, again, it sits in the ground. We want to essentially plant it in the fall and then come back in mid to late July when it's gonna be ready for harvest, pull it out. That's all I wanna to do to the garlic. I don't wanna to have to do any other weeding. I don't wanna to have to do fertilizing, anything like that. It's a, it's a low maintenance crop and I wanna keep it that way. So if you have bare soil, uh, you're gonna to have to do some cultivation. You're gonna to have to weed. If you're okay with that, absolutely go for it, you know? Uh, but the mulch is great for controlling weeds. It also helps keep moisture in. Um, and that's a really good thing come, you know, late May through July when it gets warmer. Again, we don't want to have to be watering. So if you have that mulch down, we're not going to water that garlic at all unless we have severe drought. So that's the beauty of mulch. We mulch pretty much all of our crops uh, once it starts to get really hot. So, you know, mid-June and on, uh, we're going to be mulching just about everything that we have on um, so, and by the way, you also mentioned whether the mulch has to be heat treated. It doesn't. I, ideally, you know, I do want to avoid hay that has a lot of weeds, seeds in it, uh, but we use hay as mulch all the time here. Uh, as long as it's thick enough, you usually can get away with it. Straw, though, is even better because you won't have any weed seeds in straw. Uh, it is more expensive, though, so that's the downside. Great, thank you. Um, we've got somebody saying uh, that uh, they planted a new tree two weeks ago, a cherry weeper, and it appears to be dying. Help. Mm. Okay, dying tree. Well, there could be a few reasons for that. Um, one reason is that sometimes actually trees, when, when you get them from a nursery, they might not be in great shape. So to, I don't know if you bought it, you know, if it was a potted plant or a bare root plant, Maybe you can help us out by telling us whether it was in a, in a pot in, a soil, uh, in soil or whether it was bare root. Um, one thing I would say, first of all, is if your plant dies and you got it from a nursery, tell them because they will often give you a refund or give you a free new tree in replacement. Most good nurseries offer a one-year guarantee on their plants. So if you spent some money on it, you should probably let them know and we'll probably get a free plant or a, a refund. Uh, now what happens? A lot of things could have happened to it. Um, it could have been that maybe it was underwatered. When you put in a new tree, you really want to water it heavily. I usually give a full five gallons of water when I'm planting a tree. That's really important. And at that point in the spring, if it doesn't rain, I'm going to water it once a week. If it does, if we get a good rain like we did this week, I'm not going to water at all. So I, I planted a peach tree at my house um, this past weekend. Um, it was about this big. I gave it five gallons of water. I mulched around the tree. I put some cardboard with a layer of wood chips right on top of the cardboard. And that's going to keep the grass down uh, from around that tree. And that's going to get it really nicely established. Uh, so it could have been that it was underwatered. It could have been that the soil there was so heavy, maybe it was really, really dense clay soils, in which case, if it was standing in water, if you saw water cooling in that area, it could have been that the roots just rotted. And that's a very, very common issue with trees. Cherries especially need really well-drained soil. If you don't have well-drained soil where you are, again, add compost. You can also add sand into your planting hole so that they aren't just sitting on wet soil. Um, you want it to be really well drained right around the root zone. So just work in a couple shovelfuls of sand and they'll have a much, much higher chance of survival. It said that it was a bare root burlap, burlap bag. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it, it, my guess is it was either uh, underwatered, um, although it's been you know, relatively wet. Uh, my guess, without knowing anything about the situation, is that it sat in really wet soil. That's more likely in the springtime. And can they add sand now, or is it too late? What's that? Can they add sand to it now, or is it late? No, you can definitely dig it. Yeah, again, if you, if you see water pooling in that area, that's a good sign that you want to add something. I would probably dig it up now, before that plant's very established, and work in a little bit of sand. Now. On the topic of dead plants, sometimes it looks like a plant is dead when it actually isn't. So you want to go up to it and just check. 
there's a few ways that you can check whether a plant is really dead. For one thing, a plant that's living should be flexible. You can see this peach. I can kind of move that branch around and snap, you know, it should be, have some flexibility. The better way of testing though is, let me get my pocket knife out here. One second. So if you take a knife out and you take your plant and scratch off a little bit of bark, if you see green underneath that outer bark, that means that your plant is alive. Um, if you see brown, your plant is dead. So take a look to see if it actually is dead. Maybe it just hasn't leafed out. I don't know if it tried to flower and then died. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, it might come back. But yes, if you think that you have really wet soil, really heavy clay soil, work in some sand right now. It's a good time to do that. Great, next question is, should you rotate your plants year to year? For example, put your tomato plants where you put your cucumbers the year before, mix things up year to year? That's a great question, yeah, so crop rotation. Um, so there's a lot of different theories on there in crop rotation. Um, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically the process of uh, rotating your plants. This really applies only to vegetables, it doesn't apply to fruit trees or anything that's going to be in the ground for multiple years. Um, and the theory behind crop rotation is that, uh, for one thing, each different kind of plant um, requires a different kind of nutritional profile, right? Some plants need a lot of phosphorus, some plants need a lot of calcium. So if you're rotating, you're going to balance your soil, right? It's not going to always be feeding the same thing. The other thing is that you are going to be avoiding disease buildup because, if, for example, you're planting potatoes year after year after year, you are very likely going to have soil-borne pathogens in that soil that are specific to potatoes. Now, if you rotate, that's going to give your, uh, that soil a chance to, uh, to rest. It's going to make sure that those pathogens aren't able to continue their life cycle. Um, so in general, we do practice crop rotation. And the way that I think of it is kind of two different ways. I try to rotate families. So if I plant a nightshade, which is, for example, a tomato, a pepper, an eggplant, or a potato one season, the next season I want to plant something in a different family. Maybe I want to plant something in the carrot family, which is the you know, carrots and parsnips. Maybe I want to plant a brassica, which again are the broccolis, kales, cauliflowers, cabbages. Maybe I want to plant something um, in the cucurbit family, the cucumbers, the winter squash, the melons. That's one way of thinking about it. That's usually what I do. The other way of thinking about it is uh, by the type of plant it is. So is it a root crop? Is it a fruiting crop? Um, or is it something that you're eating the stems of? Because those plants tend to have kind of similar nutritional profiles. Most roots, for example, all require a lot of phosphorus to develop. So if you're planting parsnips one season, I wouldn't plant potatoes there the next season for the most part. I want to plant something that's going to have a, a fruit that we're going to be picking. So tomatoes would be a good thing to plant after parsnips um, or kale because we're going to be eating the stems, the leaves. Uh, so that's another way of thinking about it. Um, and so, yeah, what, either of those systems, whichever one you feel comfortable with, I think they're both worth practicing. Um, so yes, do practice crop rotation, but the caveat is don't get hung up on it. If you need to plant something twice in a row, that's okay. I mean, around here in the valley, there are soils that have been planted into corn or potatoes for decades. That's not a good practice, but if you do something two, three years in a row, it's not gonna absolutely devastate your soils. It just means that you're gonna have to feed them a little bit more, and you're gonna be at a little bit more risk of soil burn pathogens and uh, certain pests building up in that area. Great question. Any, you, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, how often you should water crops? Uh, yeah. We talked a little bit about like, or how, how you, you know it has enough water so that you can avoid overwatering. That is a great question. So there's a few thi uh, things I think about when, with water. For one thing, it's really important that you don't water too frequently. A lot of people, in fact, a lot of gardeners think they're always doing a service by going out watering their plants. Um, I really recommend less frequent but heavier waterings. So 
you want to be encouraging deep root systems that are going to create resilient plants. Um, and you have to do that by watering deeply. If you're always watering a little bit, and it's just going to create a shallow root system because those roots aren't going to find any need to go deep to get to that water. So generally speaking, you need about one inch of water per week for most vegetables. Perennials can go through a lot more drought before you really need to water them. Unless you just plant them. If you're just, you know, if you just planted a tree or a shrub or anything else, you want to be watering it regularly for the first month or two. And at that point, it should be more or less self-sufficient unless we go through an extreme drought. With vegetables, you want to give them about an inch of water a week. If it rains about an inch a week, you're good. Okay, so this week, we're not going to be doing any watering out here at all because we had a really, really heavy downfall. Um, if we didn't, I'd consider watering them. But again, the real test is actually getting your fingers in the soil and checking it out. So one thing I always do before I water, I just stick my fingers in at least three inches down, and I'm just feeling for the moisture. If it feels fairly moist and wet, I'm not going to water it. If it feels really dry, about three, four inches down, then yeah, I'd consider watering. But it's important to do that because each soil type is different, right? So clay soils um, will require less water than sandy soils because they hold more moisture. So um, don't just, you know, check uh, your, your rain gauge or don't rely just on the rain to tell you whether uh, you need to water. You actually need to get your fingers in there and get some information for yourself. Great, thank you. One more question. What are good plants for beginners? That's a great question. So good plants for beginners. Um, so I, again, we talked about garlic already, so I'll mention that one. Of course, tomatoes are a classic standby. Tomatoes are extremely vigorous, easy to grow, highly recommend them. Potatoes are one of the easiest plants to put in, right? Um, and that would be something that you'd want to consider doing in April or early May if you can. So potatoes are, other than Colorado potato beetle, which is an insect, there's really not too many issues with them. They're extremely vigorous plants, extremely productive. There is no plant that we can grow that's gonna create more calories per square foot or per acre than potatoes. So if you really want something that's gonna create real resiliency in terms of just feeding you and your family, potatoes is definitely the way to go. So those are a few I'd consider. Winter squash is another one that's really easy. Um, you'd want to put that in in June. It doesn't like cold soil at all. You need to wait until it's really, really hot. Um, it does require some more space unless you're going to grow vertically. But it's extremely vigorous. It can handle really rough soils. Um, so that's another one that I would consider. Um, and beans. That's the last one. I'd Actually, uh, beans and peas I want to talk about. So both beans and peas are in the legume family, which means that they actually fix their own nitrogen. So they don't really need a lot of nutrition. Um, you don't need to give them any fertilizer at all. They'll be very, very happy in very poor soil. Um, so peas for the spring, that's what I would recommend as a really easy crop. Um, you wanna start those from seed within the next two or three weeks. Um, and beans, you want to start when it's a little bit warmer. They're also direct seeded, um, very similar to peas. Both beans and peas, by the way, have varieties that climb and varieties that are just bushy. So some varieties need a trellis and some varieties don't. And it's really important that you know which one is which. But they're ex extremely easy. They're incredibly vigorous. And they really don't need any kind of you know, special conditions to grow. So some of those that I would recommend. Um, and... There are many others, but those are a really great set to start with for this season. Great. So give them a try if you're able. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I just wanted to mention you had mentioned about um, the soil and about whether or not to put the lining in. You can get your soil tested at UMass by sending in a sample. I just looked and they, um, they are still accepting samples either by mail or as a drop off with a little bit of turnaround time. But um, if you have any um, concern or just interested, that is an option. You can just look under UMass soil testing. Um, and thank you, Dan. 
Uh, this was Thank amazing. This was really informative. Um, we really appreciate everybody who joined us. Um,